Hey everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm joined by legendary bassist, Mark the Animal Mendoza. Mark will share with us what he's been up to and some of the things he's working on right now, as well as giving us his thoughts about if there's any chance for a Twisted Sister reunion, as well as some of the products that Twisted Sister is working on to release in the next couple of years. I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. Mark was really great. So let's jump in and let's get started. just by wishing you a happy belated birthday you finally turned 21 earlier this week congratulations 21 about uh five times already yeah exactly <laughs> oh man How dog you years man life? dog years dog years that's right that's right i got pause here hands, i got pause there you go how do you celebrate the, the big day the i hit the pause button all the time <laughs> i love it i love it oh man how do you celebrate the big day um, just, I had a good time with the, the people around me, like Laura and, uh, her family and stuff. I had a great time. Nice. Nice. I actually did my podcast at night. My, my That's right. Yep. Yep. That's yep. right. That's yeah. right. You know, and let, you know, let's just talk about that for a moment, right? It's right. 20, 22 now is, is your podcast that you do, right? Right. 22 now in uh, area 22 productions is the name of the network. Yep. And when did you start doing that? Oh, four years ago, three and yeah. a half years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, it's it's a great time, and you know what? I watched some of the episodes, and most recently, you had the full Twisted Sister band, all the living members on to honor AJ, and that was, I'll say, for me. You know, everybody's got a podcast now, me and a million other people. That was the best hour and a half of podcast viewing I have seen in my <laughs> life. I think <laughs> that was so no. much fun. You, you know, Mike. It's all about the entertainment value that you can give people, whether it's serious or funny or informational um, uh, or just telling people about what's going on in life. It's about the entertainment value. Am I right? Absolutely. 100%. So when you get when, when when you could get the five of us before AJ passed away together, it was nothing but sheer mayhem all of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. You got all five of us doing something together. The host or other people couldn't get a word in. That's so, um, <laughs> But now you had four of us at the same time. And, uh, you know, it was just as crazy. So you saw it. And there's still things that we couldn't say. There was still statute of limitations is not up on some. <laughs> that we and uh, so and, you know, we kept it clean and we didn't say anything wrong about anything. And we don't really bad rap people or anything like that. So <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. It was great having the guys come on, you know, and us doing a show in the memory of AJ Pirro. It was fantastic. It really was. It really, no, it really was. And to me, I felt like I was sitting in the dressing room with you guys as you guys just BS and reminisce about the good old days and the 80s and all of that. To me, it was, it was just a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was that was uh, that was one place that uh, um, people wouldn't venture is into our dressing room. It was like a right. it was like a DMZ. It was like a mine, <laughs> minefield. Yeah, sure. no one wanted to do that. No one, the crew wouldn't go in there. No one would go in there because it was dangerous. I really, they had five guys who would uh, who would mentally, physically, and verbally abuse people. <laughs> you know, on the fun side, we didn't. Of hurt course, anything. we weren't bullies. Right, we, right. We had fun doing these things, and uh, you walk in the dressing room, or you walk anywhere near the dressing room, and you're fair game. We would aim at you and shoot. No, that's the way it should be, right? Having fun Absolutely. while you're out on the road. At a rock, you know, for a rock band, sure. Absolutely. You know, so you mentioned that you did this in honor of AJ, and I'm sure you've probably heard Jeff Labar from Cinderella passed away yesterday. Yeah, I, I you know, it, it, a good friend of mine just told me that this morning. Yeah. Um, uh, what happened? Do you, do you know what, what? No, they they haven't announced what happened. Um, I know he's only 58 years old. So I'm yeah, stopped, 58. You know? I mean, so that's, that's, awful. that's young. Yeah, that's very oh, young. Oh, so awful, man. It so is. Yeah, that. It yeah. I, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, you know. My condolences and sympathies go out to his family and 
uh, whoever was left behind. It, mm -hmm. It's just awful when you lose someone like that and to anybody and everybody. It's just horrible. So I'm sure the guys in TS will make a statement about it. Yeah, yeah. And I saw that the band did make a statement. And then this morning, their touring keyboardist, Gary Corbett, it was announced that he passed away also. So it's, it's been a rough keyboard? time. Gary Who? Corbett, the touring oh, keyboardist for Cinderella and for Kiss prior to that. So both two guys from Cinderella, touring keyboardist wow. in 24 hours. Yeah, it's amazing. I didn't hear this. Um, yeah. I've been busy. A lot yeah, of studio they just work. announced it this morning, actually. Yeah, a lot of studio. I just came from a session. Okay. So um, yeah, it, 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 you don't get a chance to listen or see the news or anything and, and yeah. for me until later on today when it slows down. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Well, you know, so you said you were in a session this morning. What are you working on these days? I was engineering and well, I do a lot of studio work. I do sure. a lot of I do some bass playing. I do a lot of engineering. And it was uh, for a um, uh, I was playing bass and also engineering a session for a pop band. Oh, nice. Yeah, I do a lot of stuff. I do. Nice. So, yeah. So that's it's it's been here and you say a pop band, right? Because I, I love all kinds of music. Even in the 80s, I loved Sister, but I loved Madonna also in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Is pop music something that you're into or is it just usually the heavy stuff? Uh, no, I'm into a lot of stuff. I I, uh, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I uh, God, how do I even start with a question like that? <laughs> um, you know, I grew up listening to swing music, my parents. <laughs> You know, um, they listen to a lot of swing. My parents are both uh, World War II veterans. And um, so they listen. I, I grew up listening to a lot of that 40s, 30s, 40s era swing music. Yeah. And then also the crooners like uh, Frank Sinatra, Sinatra yeah. Dean Martin, and, and all of them, you name it. Sure. And then, um, of course, when I discovered, um, you know, rock and roll, and I loved when I first heard the 50s when I was really young, that I latched onto mm -hmm. right away. Sure. And the 50s R&B, uh, soul, um, jazz. I'm, I'm not playing right now because I'm really not back to doing gigs yet, but I'm in a jazz quartet. We nice. play about once a month. Yeah, in really nice clubs in the city and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, a lot of different types of music. But I, I'm a mercenary when it comes to studio work. You want me, you got to pay for me, and I'll do it, and I'll leave. Sure. You know, I don't really get personally involved in anything. Just do the job that you hired me to do, and I'll get it done. Great. Sure. Right. Yeah, I usually don't engineer and play bass at the same time, but this particular act, it was uh, a husband and wife team, and they really didn't have a band. So programmed drums, played bass. He played guitar. I added some background stuff, and, you know, it's coming out nice, if that's, that's what you like. Yeah, exactly. That, that sounds awesome. Now, yeah. what drew you to bass originally as a kid? Um. I was drawn to both. I started out playing guitar and bass. I still play guitar. I'm still a oh, guitar. Nice. I'm really a guitar fanatic, you know? Oh, wow. uh, oh yeah, yeah. You know, Eddie Van Halen, you name it. A a anybody. I don't want to just say one of them. <laughs> right. um, I don't, it's not that I, I, I'm a bass fanatic too. I mean, but what happened was when I started playing guitar and playing bass at the same time, the bass was much more physical. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And, and, you could be in more bands as a bass player because every kid played guitar. Yep. <laughs> you know, every Absolutely. Kid played guitar and um, the bass was more physical. And I was able, by the time I was in junior high school, I was in four different bands. Oh, wow. So, and I would have been in one if I was just a guitar player. So true. So I never stopped playing guitar, just that professionally I, I'm known as a bass player. Okay. Well, Actually, I, I'm not known as a bass player. I really spar with it. Interesting. Okay. I don't play bass. <laughs> you spa with it. I like I that. Win. That's interesting. And you win. Yeah. Yeah, I win. Oh, man, that's very funny. Now, speaking of playing bass, you actually, we're both on Long Island. You jumped up on stage last month with D. Snyder, right? I think you did uh, Under the Blade with yeah, him. I think that was like three weeks ago, Laura. That was like three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Like three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Danny Stanton had asked Laura and I if we wanted to go to the show. And uh, yeah, why not? You know, we weren't doing anything that night. Usually I'm busy on, on those nights, most nights. And uh, it, three minutes later, my phone rang and it was D. He goes, man, you really coming to the show? I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, no, you're really going to be there. I said, well, yeah, I said, yes. I mean, look, there's something <laughs> happened and I can't make it, but we're going to be there. He goes, you got to get up and play with me. I said, yeah, of course. When did I ever say no? Right. So he goes, well, maybe under the, you know what? We're not going to take it. And he goes, no. Old school, under the blade. You want to do it? I said, I'll even bring my bass. 
Nice. So I can do everything that I normally do mm -hmm. and play under the blade. And, and I did. And his bass player, Russell, who happens to be a very good friend of mine, was, yeah, sure, man. I, I, you know, because whenever I play local gigs, he comes down and plays. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if you know Russell Pizzuto, do you? I, I know the name. I don't know him, but I do know yeah. the name. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So he was like, yeah, of course, man. It was And it was so convenient that all I had to do was take his strap over his because he had a wireless Take okay. his strap off, you know, with strap locks and just uh -huh. put it right on my base and walk out and play. Right. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Was that so, the first time yeah. you were on stage since the pandemic started? Yes. Yeah. The, my last show. Um, yeah, that's the first time I've been on stage since the oh, pandemic wow. started. And my last show was a few weeks before they locked everything down. I did a show in the cutting room in Manhattan, uh, a show called The Ultimate Jam with uh, Holy Z from ZO2. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I played that night. That was actually my last my last show. I haven't done one yet. And again, with D, it was just one song. Right. It wasn't even a whole show. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, it must have felt good, though, to be back up on stage after. Oh, I, I miss it. it that, that's the most, I don't know, I, the most fun I have is being on stage. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. No matter what band I'm in, you know, right. I, I have fun playing. Right, yeah. right. Now, you know, after doing the 22 Now thing that we spoke about briefly, where you had all four of you guys, you jump on stage with D. I've heard D talk about a possibility. Eddie talk about a possibility of the sister guys getting together, doing a song or two. I Any mean, answer that to you? People read into this stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> we are. There is no talk of us getting up and, uh, you know, doing anything. Um, we, we didn't break up. You know, the band isn't broken up. It's not like we shut the corporation down and we don't we still do business you know it was uh november for um before covid we were in florida at a, a rock and roll horror convention we appeared yep. the yep. four of us and that could happen again in the future but there's there's no plans uh, right now there's 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 not even grumblings of us doing something together there could be you know I, we've all said never say never okay. just that everybody's so fractured and doing their own thing. There's just, you know, we're not doing Twisted Sister right now. I mean, if it happened for me tomorrow, I would go. Okay. Because yeah. I, voted, I voted in favor of not retiring. <laughs> oh, did you really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I didn't want to. I, you know, I love doing what I do. Right, right. But, you know, I get the other guys had, had things they needed to attend to and, uh, you know, other things in life they wanted to do. Okay. Uh, so that's the way it went. Uh, well, like you said, I guess never say never, right? We don't know what tomorrow right. means. Exactly. Yeah. I just hope that if we're going to do something, it happens before something happens to one of the guys that are left. I agree. You know? yeah. I agree. You never know what's around the corner. And, you know, going back to that um, 22 Now thing, one of the things I loved is just seeing that camaraderie that you guys had together. And, you know, you hear about bands breaking up and they don't talk to each other. But I'm like, these guys, I remember D in the movie you guys put out a few years ago said he loved that the reunion, quote unquote, fixed things between the band's members. Mm -hmm. And I saw that to me when I was on watching and you guys goofing on each other and D calling himself uh, an asshole and being difficult and, and you guys ribbing each other. And I'm like, it just seemed like a fun time for you guys. And it, it has, um, you know, we all, we all have different situations in life, which keeps us with friends or coworkers or business people or whatever it is. I have to say, um, and I have a lot of situations in life outside of the music industry. Sure. And uh, I have to say that the band, the guys in the band and some associated people are the funniest MFers <laughs> that I have ever been around. And, and, and I'm telling you, it, it is just Hollywood could not write these scripts. <laughs> That's it, great. Couldn't, it, is, it is so gut. I mean, gut crunching, funny, all of us, you know, you start to, you, your diaphragm starts to hurt and right. you're hearing, you're laughing so hard that there's tears. And that's how funny it is, you know, and we don't, we didn't realize it to other bands and other people, you know, came to us and made us recognize this because <coughs> say we're at a show at one of the big festivals, mm -hmm. even, even if the band was to play a small venue, but when you get around us where the dressing room area is, there's nothing but arguing and fighting and screaming and jokes. <laughs> and, you know, there's no serious fights, you know, right, right. and the road crew is getting beat up and there's things getting thrown around. And then you look at in dress rooms of some of these other bands and they're all just like kind of moping and hanging out <laughs> right, right. on their phones. Not when you get down to the end of the hallway where we are, it's just right. nonstop mayhem. Right, so right. yeah, you can't, you, you, you just, I was, I'm in a band still because the band is really not broken up. I'm in a band and I'm going to include AJ for right now with four of the funniest guys I ever met in my life in any situation. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, Hollywood couldn't write these scripts. That's yeah. how funny it is. 
that that's awesome. Yeah. Now, I read a story about you when the reunion first started to take place in 2001, and I'm curious if it's true. The first rehearsal, you brought a gun and put it on top of the. You know what? You know what? Yeah. that did not happen. Okay, excellent. that is not that is not my hand because I have <laughs> never worn cut off gloves, and okay. if you look at that hand, it's a lot smaller than this bare paw. <laughs> right. I have never owned a polished stainless steel 45 okay. and I never took a gun out and put it on the amp. I wouldn't do that. It's not my style. <laughs> and that was um, a poetic license because <laughs> of a story that had nothing to do with a gun that mm. details about me. So I guess the producer or the director decided to, well, let's amp this up a little bit. So sure. I, uh, I was unhappy with that. I was almost going to sue them for that because it may, it put me in a really bad light. Like I was threatening someone with a firearm, right. which is not something I would do. I just, <laughs> you know, no, it never happened. Never Good. happened. Good. Thank you for clearing that up once and yes. for all. For me. Yes. Now I was at the nine 11 show you guys did, you know, mm -hmm. which was the first reunion show. What do you remember about that show for you as a band? And even just that night? Well, you know, um, I'll add some, uh, not that there's any non-truth or fiction, but I'll add some truth. You know, when 9-11 happened, um, it was really just JJ and I, because we really never fell out of friendship. We were always very close, even when the band wasn't together playing. And it was really just JJ and I that were, were talking and, and still socializing and things. And we really weren't talking. I mean, I, I hadn't talked to D in many years. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no interest. And um, when JJ called me and asked me if I would be part of a 9-11 um, benefit show, a charity show. Um, I thought about it for 10 seconds and said I would do it. My problems with other members of this band are much smaller than what's going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll do it. He goes, oh, I'm glad because I wasn't going to ask them first. I was going to ask you. <laughs> okay. I know you put up the most resistance to it. And it's not, let's just clear this up for people who are watching this interview. And it's not because I don't love twisted sister i would do it tonight if they said to me there's an emergency show in manhattan right or new jersey and we got to play tonight mm -hmm. i'm on my way you're on your way right that's how much i love playing in the band so it's not for the lack of love of twisted sister or the songs it was just sometimes a band or band members it's kind of a marriage and it goes bad and you just can't okay. do it anymore so but this was bigger than a failed marriage this was um you know 9 11 happened and we lost a lot of people and have since lost a lot more people because of what exactly. went on so like i said it was it was bigger than my problems with uh you know with d or anybody else in this band so mm -hmm. i said yes right away 10 okay. seconds later yeah i'm in whatever it takes i'll do it awesome and what do you re what do you remember about the show that night once you guys hit the stage well um it was like we never stopped playing Agreed. you know because we hadn't played together i think in 14 years. Yep. You know, it was, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, we never stopped playing. It was very easy to do. We did a couple of rehearsals and, um, and, that, and one of those rehearsals was the one about the, the gun on the amplifier. Okay. Never happened. Right. That came from that time, that time period. Mm -hmm. That's, that's when that was, uh, and clear it up. That never happened. Nothing. Right. Nothing right. Like that ever happened ever. So, uh, but yeah, no, it was great. It was, um, you know, one of the things I love in life the most is being on stage with Twisted Sister, you know, with the band. It's um, it's as good today as it was December 10th, 1978, my first time on stage with Twisted Sister. So, and that was exciting. And it still is that exciting for me. I love it. I really do. You know, it's funny. I was talking to someone else, a good friend of mine the other day on, on one of my shows. Yeah. And um, I said, we talked about, um, you know, of course, we toured the world. We've been in most places of the world, and it takes a lot of traveling. And I always said, I play for free. I get paid to travel because I, I like hate that. traveling. Okay, I mean, it's enough, enough flights, enough hotels, enough transportation. And what do I have fun doing? I have fun playing. So if I was away and I could play gigs during the day and I could play gigs on days we were off, I would play. You know, right. I just I really love that level of it all. So yes. There was no, there's no dislike whatsoever for, you know, playing in Twisted Sister or playing music. I love it. Right. Now you mentioned going back to December 78, when you first joined the band, 
we're both Long Island guys. I'm always fascinated by the fact that you guys played Adventureland, which is right by where I live, the parking lot in seven, July of 79. 79, <laughs> yes, 79. And they were prepared for about, um, as I remember it, they were prepared for around 3,000 people who showed up. Yeah. They actually said it was about 24,000. And I remember walking on that stage, um, looking at, in, in, in Adventureland, I mean, most of the world doesn't know what it is. Right, it's exactly. a local amusement park. It's not Great Adventure in New no, Jersey. It's, it's a small it's a amusement park. Yep. It's a very small amusement park, really meant for kids, yep. right? Great. It's really yep. meant for, for, for family and kids. There's Great. no insane wild rides. And, and, not at all. Um, you know, you and I would look funny getting on those rides. Without you know? a doubt. <laughs> although I did... Although I did rob the train there about three times. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I stopped the train and robbed everybody. Oh, nice. Yeah, the one that goes around the park, yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the one that goes around the park. I, I knew you were busting. Trying to that. derail it, I try to rob everybody. Nice, <laughs> very nice. But in any case, um, so it really is kind of a child, you know, a, a child of Kitty Park. And um, they wanted, they had this larger area the way it was back then. I remember the stage faced, faced, faced east, and there's all those massive warehouses and buildings. And we walked on stage and there was people on top of all of these buildings, you know, and I, and we look around and Suffolk County Police Department has 110 completely closed because there's thousands of cars out there. So they estimated we had about 24,000 people showed up and they had nowhere to put everybody. So they climbed on top of the buildings. They went on top of cars and vans and trucks. I remember there was a line of track the trailer tractors at a at a loading docks and there's people on top i mean it was just it was insane it really was we didn't expect it to be like that and to me one of the fascinating things about that is some people might not realize this that same evening kiss who was at the peak of their career was yes. playing madison square garden to yes. twelve thousand people so there's exactly. kiss at the peak of their career pretty much playing to twelve thousand at the garden sisters oh. playing adventure land to unsigned band to twenty four thousand people i find that fascinating well, yeah, but you also, you can't fit any more than that in Madison Square Garden. True. You know, <laughs> Very you know, true. I, let's not, I'm not trying to put Kiss down at all. No, I don't, no, no, I don't take it that way. Like that. But, you know, it is a capacity place, whereas out there, they just couldn't stop the people. It was overwhelming. It's a much larger area. I remember it well. I remember it vividly, even though it was back in the summer of 1979. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other one to me that I'm always fascinated about is that you guys sold out the Palladium in New York City, again, as an unsigned band. Unsigned band. Right. Unsigned band. That was a lot of fun. Right, it right. Was a great, it's, and great night. It's, to me, it's totally amazing. Now, both of those stories and others are in the movie that you guys put out. I guess it's, what, five, six years ago at this point? Right? Well, let's, let's, let's establish something here. Yeah. We didn't put the movie out. Oh, okay. We were in the movie, an independent producer-director named Andrew Horn who unfortunately is no longer with us. Mm, okay. He passed away a few years ago. Um, he decided that he wanted to do a documentary, especially on the early days of Twisted Sister. And um, let me start, add another little piece here and start by sure. saying, a lot of people don't know. They think that in 82, 83, <laughs> we got signed and we started doing records. Right. But they don't realize that the band had a 10 year club history before a that. A couple of thousand day. shows, a couple of thousand shows before you got uh, Over 3,000. Amazing. In, in 10 years. Right. And of course, JJ French was the only original member from when the band started in 1970, late 72. So Andrew wanted to document all of that, hence why a lot of it had to, 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 uh, to deal with JJ and how he grew up and how the band formed around him because it was well on its way. We were a tremendous club band when I joined. Mm -hmm. we were one of the top three, you know, there was the, out of the top, all the bands, it was Twisted Sister Zebra and, and, and the Good Rats. You know, right. those are like the really top drawing band. There were other great bands too that were great. Huh. Don't, I'm not putting anybody down, but uh, that's really how it went. And he wanted to document the time period in the beginning when that really was never talked about or or even any records made about it. You know, so JJ did a lot of work with Andy and some of us uh, with with the help of the rest of us to try to put a timeline together as how these things happened and how we got to like 1982. Mm -hmm. you know, because it basically that movie basically ended when AJ joined the band. Right. Not that we didn't want to include him, or again, it wasn't our decision. We were in the movie and we helped. We okay. did not direct it. We did not edit it. We, anything like that. We just helped Andrew Horn in any way we could, and he did an amazing job. 
Yeah, no, I, I think it's an amazing movie. Yeah. And I look at it now and I say that movie was a couple of years ahead of its time because now music documentaries like that are the, all the rage, right? There's there's the uh, couple of different ones that have come out. Freddie Mercury's come out in the last year. Kish just had one on A&E for a couple of nights. But let, let me go back a little further than yeah. this because it really, once they did a, an edit on the movie, it turned out to be almost five hours. <sighs> wow. And they thought about putting it out in pieces, you know, like three pieces. But they they did they matter. I mean, if Andy was still with us, maybe it would have he would have included all of the footage that didn't make it, or try to do some uh, extra uh, another movie, another two and a half hour movie with the rest mm -hmm. of it in there. I don't know. I don't know what his plans were. Right. But um, yeah, it actually turned out to be a five hour, almost a five hour movie, and uh, a lot of tons of great information. I mean, they had a they had they had to make it shorter. You know, they either had to do it in pieces or make it shorter. Mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. He did the best he could with the two and a half hours that he was allotted to do it. Right. Yeah. Now, at the end of the movie, if I remember right, it says, like like you said, it's just when AJ joins the band and the mm -hmm. band is just starting that they got signed, the right. band rise. Right. And then it says something along the effects of, um, well, that's a story for another day, you know, about the popularity of the band. Any well, thoughts of doing another movie? Again, it wasn't our thought. Right. It wasn't yeah. our, we didn't bring it up to anybody. There were a couple of people, uh, independent producers, interested on taking it from that point on um nothing has uh nothing has some nothing has come together about any of that stuff mm -hmm. nothing has uh, surfaced uh, uh permanently it is a little grumblings here and there but uh you know if, if somebody wants to do it i'm sure we'll all help and you know document everything we possibly can yeah i, I find the twisted sister story so unique and fascinating and like you said it was that 10 year time in the clubs then you guys skyrocket to success on the heels of mtv just break in and you guys have these huge videos d is testifying in the senate then the brand kind of crashes it's it's such a fascinating story about the band to me yeah it's uh and a lot of ups and downs you know yeah. and listen i'm not taking anything from any other bands or acts or people in the music business but uh the only thing i can talk about is the experiences that i have with the bands that i've been in Mm -hmm. uh, professionally and non-professionally club bands so um most bands like twisted sister didn't have a 10-year history they got together and within a year they were signed and going on the road making right. albums were yep. big and, and we had it we were already a, a touring machine we played four to six nights a week three shows a night um like machinery you know all within about a hundred mile radius of new york city <laughs> right you know, yep. oh yeah, it was it was insane. The schedule was nuts. You know, yep. it, it just was. It was five days a week. You did nothing else but drive to a gig, be there for six or seven or eight hours, and then drive if it was too far away, go to some cheap hotel and, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and stay the night and go to the next one. You know, we right, had right, a right. twenty-four foot U-Haul truck with all our equipment in it. You know, right. we had a great deal from U-Haul then, and uh, you know, there was quite often we would go pretty far from here within about uh, within 100 miles if you want to call it far but right. too far to drive back and forth every night and we stay in a cheap hotel go to the next town stay in a cheap hotel. so we do that for four or five nights a week a lot of times we went home but mm -hmm. a lot of times you were just staying in some flea bag hotel you know right. that, uh, you know you were a club band right of course yeah. of course yeah. that's what you did yeah. now and one it was of the fun back then Right. So yeah. one of the things I take from you, in the especially in the last 20 years, when I see you at Sister, you seem happy, appreciative, talking to you, very happy, appreciative. If I rewind to the 80s, at least to me as a fan, you always played like that angry role to me, it looked like. Was that just an act? Am I wrong in saying that? Or were you really like angry in the 80s? What's my name? <laughs> the animal. <laughs> there you go. There you, uh, right. there you go. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, I was never angry. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not really an angry person. Right. I was never angry. It was, it was a, the portrayal of a character that I had fallen in when I joined the dictators, yep. you know, early in my music, professional music career. And it stuck and everybody liked it. I liked it. I had no problem. So, you know, it was so funny that it, I actually took on kind of the role of a professional wrestler. <laughs> and um, so funny that in the 80s, when we got big, there was a couple of the, the wrestling teams like the Freebirds that said, hey, you want to come and join us and wrestle? And I was like, I don't have time for this. You know, I really didn't want to get hurt that bad. <laughs> Those guys take a, a beating. And I, <laughs> Without a doubt. Yep. This is how I make money. I can't. Yeah, hurt, you can't hurt the hands. Or hurt a wrist <laughs> or I was like, yeah, you know what? I won't do that. Right. Without so, a doubt. Yeah. 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 yeah now, to me, you always had like a great 
deep bass sound. Who were your bass influences growing up as a kid? Oh, God, so many. Um, God, where do I start? Um, all right, so a, a bass player from, from a stand up bass player that I latched onto from my parents, um, an early, uh, amazing stand up bass player, Charles Mingus. Okay. Uh, just unbelievable. And I latched onto him for feel. You know, okay. they weren't as crazy as bass players as they are now, but the feel of what he played with in James Jameson, you're talking about early influence, James Jameson, who did all the Stevie Wonder hits, the early mm -hmm. Stevie Wonder stuff. You, you can't, you, that's feel, that's incredible feel. And then as you go through, um, you know, all the guys who played a lot of the 50s stuff, whether it was on electric bass or stand-up bass, again, it's the feel that they played with. They didn't sure. play a lot of riffs like we do today and, and right. crazy stuff, but it was all the feel. And there was, there was a ton of jazz bass players that I liked. And then if you're talking about rock, you know, some of my early influences were like Noel Redding, um, uh, John Paul Jones, Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. yep, uh, Greg, uh, a, a, a bass player that a lot of people don't, don't even pay attention to was Greg Ridley from Humble Pie. You mm -hmm. want to talk about playing rock music with a feel, yeah. okay, you know? Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. But, you know, we need to move on. And there's so many, you know, Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. I mm -hmm. love plays. Billy Sheehan. They, yep. He's just fanatic an unbelievable bass player um you know and then of course you got all the all the, the big names that, that are around you know like victor wooten guys in human and it's mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> and um you know stanley clark i've met all the guys i've talked to them they're great guys man and and they're great players there's just so so many there's so many that that i influence with and it is there's um you know as you see me do more things people like i just did a song for it for a charity reason um for the, you know who David Z is? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the David Z Foundation, I got together with with three other um, music, great musicians, mm -hmm. um, and we did uh, an old blues song, but we did a rock version the way Cactus did it. The song's oh. called The Evil. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. So you should look up what we did. It's now on the internet because the, the actual charity event for the David Z Foundation was this past. Just past Sunday. weekend, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it's out there and everybody can see it. But, uh, you know, I played crazy bass in it you know uh, everybody goes i never saw you play like that well i'm always in ts it doesn't require it. Right. you know you got to do that as a musician you got to do the job that you're required to do and in ts it doesn't require any insane playing it requires a very feel and rhythm playing you know and lock in with whoever the drummer is mostly mm -hmm. aj barrel right. so um but yeah i mean I, I i've got i'm also like i said a guitar fanatic you know and um you know we lost two of my favorites in the last eight months and Eddie Van Halen and Leslie West, mm -hmm. you know, those two guys, man. And I watched Eddie Van Halen bow down to Leslie West because that guy is the king of Kings um, uh, on, on guitar. There is nobody who imitates him. Nobody gets away with it. No one can make it happen. And uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I love, I love music. I love, I'm, I'm fanatic about all types of music and uh, um, anything I hear, there's even some unknown bands and you, you hear something that they play and you're like, Whoa, wait a minute. Wow, that's amazing. That's and you always awesome. pick it up. You always listen. I'm never I'm never uh, closed to hearing music, even if it's an unsigned, unknown band. You know, you go out and see a band locally and you, you watch the musicians and you're like, oh, God, look at that drummer or look at the bass player or something right. like that. There's always things you can learn and pick up. And talk I think to. that's awesome because most people, I'll say our age, um, feel like there's no good music anymore, right? Uh, the music is no good, nothing good since 1978 or whatever year they choose, right? So it's kind of refreshing to hear somebody say, they could appreciate some new stuff. You know, also. growing up, um, my parents, again, both music. My mom, my father wasn't a musician. He okay. couldn't do anything. My mom was an incredible play, a piano player and singer. Okay. You know, she really was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when I started to get into rock music and play things, uh, my parents are very, I got to say that, you know, most people, their parents don't support them. When they see them doing something, they say, mm -hmm. you wasted your time. Mm -hmm. and my parents saw I was serious about this. They supported me. They really did. And um, the fact that uh, they made it easier for me to, to pursue this when they saw at an early age, I was playing in multiple bands. I was responsible. You know, I went to school. I didn't give them a hard time about that. I did well in school. I started college. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't finish college because I joined the dictators. I'm like, sure. college? Or tour the world with a band. Right, right. Uh, I know where That's I'm That's an going. easy choice, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, think about that. Right. They weren't happy about that decision, but you know, look at 
look at history. So yeah. um, I would have to say that uh, because of them and their support, it made it a bit easier for me to pursue what I wanted to do. And um, I was in a, at 16, I was in a club band playing with guys who were all 19 and 20. Mm-hmm. And my father, and you couldn't hide him. He was like six foot four. It's like oh, wow. okay. a linebacker, you know, mm-hmm. and he dwarfed me even now, if he was still around, mm-hmm. he's bigger than me. So, but yeah, he, he and my mom snuck into a couple of these clubs we were playing and watched to see what we were doing and, you know, what's going on. And I never knew that until years later. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you were 16. We went, because I couldn't drive. The guys okay. had to me up <laughs> in a van and we'd go do a gig and they dropped me off at, you know, 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And it was always on weekends, so I didn't have to go to school. Okay, nice. Come in and, and sleep. My father was awake when I'd get home. He was always up at four in the morning, no matter okay. what. You know, mm-hmm. he was an early rise at work and mm-hmm. he was also a fisherman. So, you know, I'd be putting my equipment in the garage and I'd come in the house and he'd, you know, he'd be sitting there reading the paper like this. <laughs> you know, yeah. and he goes, uh-huh. I can't even imitate it. He had a deep voice that was okay. incredible. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Good. It's like God speaking to you. <laughs> oh, that's Good great. Gig. Yeah, Dad, it was great. He goes, all right, take a shower, get some sleep. You know, nice. you got to remember, what people don't remember these days now is back then you could smoke in a club and they were all crowded. Absolutely, yep. So we came home, and remember, I had a big head of hair. Right. right? <laughs> here, but big head of hair. And you would come home and you would smell like an ashtray. Right. Yep. And I didn't smoke. I didn't like cigarette smoke. I didn't like, I never smoked pot. I hated the smell of it. Mm-hmm. All of those things. So you'd have to wash it to go to sleep and your hair would hit your face. You'd be like, oh God, it smells like an ashtray. Right. <laughs> clothing would smell like an ashtray. Horrible. You'd mm-hmm. have to strip everything down. It was horrible. You know, and, and wash your hair and, you know, then get some sleep because it was just awful smelling. It really was. And, you know, now you don't have that anymore. You know, you don't have that in clubs. But I'll tell you what, I probably breathe enough smoke for 10 lifetimes that's you know? yeah, absolutely like when, when you couldn't smoke at a club anymore it's like i i quit smoking <laughs> that's so true <laughs> um yeah so but i don't forget when the dictators we headlined um the new york academy of music which turned into the palladium right you remember yep. that yes absolutely academy of music and you know who opened up for us who's that zebra yeah. No. Oh, okay. oh, oh this is no. the dictator. Sorry, the dictator. Sorry. Dictators. Right. No. Who's AC, that? DC with Bon Scott. Yes, with Bon Scott. Absolutely. Before, like before they were big. Yes. Bon Scott. So I'm glad. And we actually were doing a small tour with them. Mm-hmm. And whatever city, whoever was bigger, would be the one that would headline. Right. So um, we played a bunch of a bunch of dates with AC, DC in those days. And uh, you know, I'm glad. Although Brian Johnson's a good friend of the guys in TS and mine. Um, you know, it was great to have witnessed AC, DC with Bon Scott. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a, to now, to me, one of the things that's that's great with the whole Twisted Sister story is you said before, rightly so, you gave JJ a bunch of credit. He's there since 72, the only oh, person. Right? Yeah. Yeah. When, when you joined Twisted Sister in 78, you can make a case that you were the most successful musician in the band to that point. Um, yeah. It, I mean, that's that's an interesting thing. I mean, the band uh, TS had their own success locally. We were huge. The band commanded, uh, you know, every gig was packed to the gills and, you know, and then some. Mm-hmm. So um, the only difference was, is I was a, a well-known uh, personality or bass player because of the dictators around the mm-hmm. world, you right. know, and I was already roadworthy. You know, I knew what it was like to tour. I mean, I, did, I mean, playing clubs is great. And, don't, and I loved the TS mm-hmm. Club days. I, I, right. I had a great time doing it and I loved it. But when you make that switch to actually traveling and being on a tour, it's a whole different existence. You know, because now when, when, when TS first started the tour and we would get like 40 minutes as an opening band, we're like, we're used to playing hours in one night. <laughs> right, right. It's like your energy level is unbelievable. And you're like, now what do we do for the next 23 hours. Right. Like, right. <laughs> you know? right. So, um, and you weren't doing interviews because no one knew who you were and you right. weren't doing anything else. So, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting to, to actually, again, witness that transformation from a club band to a real touring band and playing all originals at that point. Right. You know, because in the clubs, TS did about 50 50 originals and copy music. Right. You know? Right. Now, to that point, 
I know obviously when Twisted Sister hit big, you guys covered leader of the pack, which you were doing in your club days. And I believe I've read where you voted against doing that for the album. Is that correct? Well, you can see that it didn't turn out well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we did it. We did it in the club days as a novelty thing. Right. You know, and it was funny. You have a whole night to play. We did a few things that were novelties that weren't just straight ahead, four by four rock, kick you in the face stuff. And we did a few things that weren't like that. But um, I did not want to do Leader of the Pack as a single. Off, Mm -hmm. I mean, TS has so many great songs and D is such a great rock metal songwriter. Why the hell are we doing that? Mm -hmm. And the song is a great song. I mean, the original is is unbelievable. You know, It, it really is. It says all about that time period when that song was written. But for us to release it as, as, as a single and do that video, you know, and spend all that money on that thing, I, I, to me, no. And you can see it didn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, right. The world wasn't ready for that. Maybe the club scene was when we played clubs doing it. But the world wasn't ready for TS doing a novelty song like Leader of the Pack. Right. You know, like you said, it's a great song. I just I don't know if it's a great Twisted Sister song, but it's a great song. Well, in the right circumstances like when we played right. pubs you know it was a novelty that we did and we did a few songs as novelties sure. which had all night to entertain not just an hour and a half right absolutely now you mentioned z as a songwriter did you ever look to get involved in the songwriting in twisted sister at all or um, anything that you're not credited on maybe um well i helped i helped arrange most of the songs hmm, okay. you know, he didn't play guitar well and for um, the albums he would just have an idea and i would first of all if you really want it for us, I had, we had to find the right key that D could sing in. Sure. So he would say, I'd say, sing it where you want it to be. And it just so happened that it always turned out to be like a or E or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, G or something, some common key that was a major key with the exception of the price Mm -hmm. was in D. But uh, yeah, I I mean, it was always, I was the first one usually who just worked with him and, and, and help him put the songs together, just arrange them, so they could be demos. Right, right, right. Nice. Time, sure. And then in more recent years, when you guys re-recorded Stay Hungry or Still Hungry, you were involved in the producing and you produced it, the Twisted Christmas album also. Is that uh, something, yeah. obviously you said before you're working with other bands, that's something you enjoy now? Yeah, I, I always love being in the studio. As far as um, when TS came through everything, like uh, with Under the Blade, Can't Stop Rock and Roll, and of course Stay Hungry, I was always the member in the band that stayed in the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, always, always. I was there through the whole process. So I assisted a lot. I did a lot of engineering there. We also had great engineers and producers. You know, everybody was, was great in their own right. So it was also a learning experience to me, sure. man. I just wanted to soak up everything that I possibly could. Without a doubt. I was there for every every album that was made. I was there yep. for them. Yeah. Yep. And then when I got a chance to uh, actually engineer and produce, I had a an engineer that worked with me, George Marshall, on also on the uh, the Christmas album and Still Hungry. Yep. Uh, but I engineered a lot of it and I produced the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, I know I when I was watching your podcast with the guys, I think you guys mentioned that you're going to look to re-release the um, Big Hits and Nasty Cuts album. Is that correct? Yes. There are a few things that are going to come, that are definitely going to come out. And that is one of them. And we're going to add some songs to it. And I believe it's actually... Coming out on LP. Oh wow, nice! You know, some plastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yes, for collectors, it'll be CDs. It'll be plastic. It'll be you know a lot of stuff going along with it. You know, a book, I believe, and lyrics and and pictures and explanations and circles and squares on the back of each photo, things like that. Nice. You, know, you have any idea that. what what was that? You didn't know where that was from, do you? The circles and squares. Circles and squares and that one went over my head. Back of each picture, and Alice's restaurant. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. I remember that show. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, um, uh, it, it, it's, uh, yes. Uh, JJ and I, and also you know, Eddie and D, not that they're not involved, they are. Mm-hmm. We will continue to put out more product as we see fit. Um, I'm going through the archives now to find things that, um, and so is JJ. JJ found some stuff before I was in the band that I believe we're going to release. Yeah. I'll see if I can master it and make it sound a little bit better. Um, recordings with with Kenny Neal, who was the bass player before me. Sure, nice. Yeah, he was talking. You mind? I was like, no, man. Let me let me get a shot at remastering this stuff and try to make it sound better for for everybody. So, um, yeah, a bunch of originals that I know nobody ever heard and mm-hmm. things like that. So that'll be in the future, you know, next the next couple of years. And uh, I'm also 
Um, I believe I've located the cassettes. Because remember, in the 80s, you worked off a cassette. So of course, yeah. it's actually a cassette of me playing with D, writing, um, you know, putting together, um, we're not going to take it. I want to rock oh, and wow. the price and, and things like that. It's just the two of us sitting in his basement and me with a boombox recording it. That sounds so, awesome. I don't know what condition it's in. I don't want to touch it until we can, uh, what they call bake the tape. If you mm -hmm. know yep. Oh, I know exactly what you so mean. Yep. I want to see it because I don't, it, again, it's from the early 80s and right. it doesn't look like it's in good shape. Right. So, Unfortunately, it was one of the few, one of those tapes were one of the few things I didn't digitally transfer over mm. and, uh, you know, try to preserve. But we're going to we're going to try to make that happen. Right. Yeah. Usually, like you said, you have to bake them and make sure that the tape doesn't break apart when you try to play it for the first oh, time yeah. in 30, 40 and years. Tape, and cassette tape was junk anyway. You know, right. who thought that you wanted to use it 45 years later. Well, I got a cassette player about five feet to my right over here, literally, because <laughs> I still go back. I and still have. To yeah. I still have a cassette player, a a a DAT player, you know, digital audio tape player, oh, yeah, and also the uh, miniature uh, disc player. Oh, nice. Right. Things nice. were stored on that too. So yep. I have all of these things that have information on it. So I make sure I have a working version of everything. Well, thankfully you saved all that stuff because well, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. You know, whatever I find it is usable, we'll, we'll put out in a future release. That sounds awesome. Now, one of the things I always loved in the 80s, you guys had that MTV concert. It was a live video from the Stay Hungry tour. Right. But you haven't been able to find that. I think it was released one day, like an independent record store, like 15 years That's ago. That's interesting. I never checked on that because, I, you know, I have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. But that that album, that particular show was um, uh, was recorded in San Bernardino, California. Yeah. Yep. Convention Center in San Bernardino. And the audience there was an invite. Oh, you know, okay. Had to sign up for it because they weren't tickets sold. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was an invite kind of thing. And it was. There was a few, there was like, I'd say a thousand people there. I mean, the, the hall was a lot bigger, but it, we didn't want it to be an uncontrollable crowd. Right, right. But that, it was about a thousand people. Yeah. Any, any chance that that could be re-released maybe? Um, that probably could be. Um, I, I don't believe it, anybody owns the rights to it except for us. Okay. You'd have to look at that. But yeah, yeah, we're looking at everything we can possibly do to, since there's technically no touring band, or no band that's going to put out new originals or anything like that. Right. So, you know, we're, we're constantly looking and, and delving into and diving into our uh, our supplies of, of information that we have stored away. Right, you know, right. Deep, 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 like way past the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Now, what about this whole thing with Clive Palmer in Australia? Obviously, rewriting, we're not going to take it, you know. Seems like so many politicians want to latch on to we're not going to take it. Does that bother you? Or? Um, I don't get into, although I have my own political views, I don't get into saying I like somebody or dislike somebody. No. Um, I don't want it used for a criminal reason, you know, if somebody's really sure. a criminal. Um, but, you know, you really can't, um, you really can't stop someone from using material if they're not selling it. Okay. You know, you really can. You can't. The laws about copyrights are a little bit different in Australia. So that's why they had actual court case about it. But even the fact that um, he lost the court case, he's going to appeal it. It's going right. to be in court for years, you know, for a yep. long time. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, that's a tough call. Um, you know, I don't I don't particularly don't want anybody to use it. Right. Whether I agree with you or not, I don't want anybody to use it. You know, sure. that's, that's why I don't say anything about politics or religion on my shows mm -hmm. because you lose half your audience. I fully agree with you a thousand percent. Oh, and, and I'm really here about the entertainment value. I'm not yep. here to preach to anybody. I don't want to be preached to whether I like it or not. Yeah. I agree with you or not. I don't, I don't want to hear any of that. I'm here for an entertainment value. Yep. You want to hear politics, then go someplace else. You want to hear religion goes and I'm not anti-politics or anti-religion. Right. I'm just not doing it. No, more credit to you. I wish more people yeah, in the yeah, industry I, was I, like I, that, in my opinion. I want to hear it. I'm tired of hearing it. It, it really is. It just it gets too many people cranked up and, and it, it's too much of uh, it's too much division. Yep. You no, know, it's too much hardcore line and division. And I don't like that. Agreed. Now, yeah. more recent years, you've been playing with Joe Rock and the All Stars. You yes, also have matter of fact, it's so funny you say that. All right. We played together last night for the first time in like I don't know, more than a year and a half. We had a rehearsal. Nice. 
Nice. Yes. Just we want to see if we still can do it. And I'm like, you guys <laughs> like get on a bicycle. Exactly. Please. You know, do you ever forget how to do that? No, you know, of course not. Like, you know, washing your hair. You ever forget how to do that? <laughs> no. I, don't I, don't, much I, I, I was going to say, I don't have them. That's why I get big headphones because it covers the <laughs> <of> walls. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, I, no, we we had fun. We played a whole bunch of songs at, at Joe's house in his basement, and uh, he actually put it on. Um, what was it? Laura? What was, what was on YouTube Live? That's Facebook what they call it. Facebook Live. I'm Facebook sorry. Live. Okay. Facebook Live. Yeah, I didn't even realize he had a camera in the corner and he was talking to it like he was on the air at WB. Right. Was, nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't care. It was great. I, you know, people got to see it, and uh, yeah. So I hopefully in in the near future we'll be doing some shows. Because I haven't done any live shows except for appearing with with Dee Snider and playing yeah. one song. I haven't done anything since COVID lockdown. Right, right. live anyway, live. I've right. been doing studio work and right. working on my own projects too. But yeah, haven't done. And, and the Joe Rock stuff was usually, correct me if I'm wrong, more so like the tri-state area, right? Long Island. Yeah, we don't go further than that. Right. It's mostly. Uh, I want to say that we mostly don't even leave Nassau. Maybe a little bit. Of <laughs> right. Okay. Once in a while, Manhattan. Right. You know, but, uh, we haven't. I really, I don't remember us playing in New Jersey or Connecticut. It's also okay. Nassau and Western Suffolk that we play in, you know? So, uh, and it's just, it, it's just tough to, you know, this day and age with the traffic, the way it is, you go to New Jersey to play a show, you, it, it's, it's like an 18 hour ordeal. You, know, yeah. traffic you ain't kidding. Traffic. You ain't kidding. You know, and then drive home and uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. So right. you know, we stay local. I mean, this talks of us actually, um, we had some offers to play in New Jersey and Connecticut, you know, sometime later in the year. We might do it. Okay. We might do it. Um, uh, you know, we've done a few things. Is We've opened up a 38 special a couple of times locally, mm -hmm. like in the Paramount. And they wanted us to do a show in New Jersey and one in Connecticut with them, I think, closer to the holidays. So if it works out right, we'll, we'll do it. We'll play, another, we'll play other markets. That's sure. awesome. Now, I know last year I had Z on my show. He was promoting his live album. And he was, we were talking about the fact that there was a Funko that was supposed to come out. Any word about the rest of the band getting potentially a Funko? I don't think his ever came out, but any word on the band getting a Funko pop? Because you guys are perfect for that. What, what are you saying? A what? A, it's a little Funko pop. Oh, the, the dolls. The dolls. It's the little dolls, yeah. What, what's, what's the Laura? What's the Laura? What's the answer for that? You have your own Funko coming out. I, I, according to Laura, I have a Funko of me coming out. It Excellent. must be very Funko. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, they're very collectible these days. And to me, Twisted Sister just fits right in with. Yeah, with yeah, absolutely. I have a few, um, you know, various things that people have. Uh, a good friend of mine gave me a few. Nigel, of uh, I got one of Lemmy. And, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the Lemmy one is great. I love right. it, man. Yeah. The best gifts I got. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. So they're fun. It's great stuff. And, um, yeah, we would fit right in with uh, little Funko dolls and uh I'm sure it's going to happen. Good. Awesome. Well, is there anything else you want your fans to know about that you're working on? Twisted Sister, your own stuff, whatever it is. Well, um, I've been working on a project, but what put a big dent in it is uh, um, COVID. Okay. Um, I have a, my own band, a, a, a rock band, Animal Tactics. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we're calling it ATX. Okay. And um, I just started working on it again. And um, if you watch the song that we... Uh, well, the, myself and, and, and a few other people. Uh, and I got to give them credit right here. I mean, the drummer for the song Evil was Joe um, Joey Quesada from ZO2. Mm -hmm. um, the singer was Militia Vox. Okay. Judas Priestess Band. She's incredible. So mm -hmm. is Joey. But my guitar player, um, he was amazing. And he was faithful to the original guitar player and Cactus, Jim McCarty. And um, he is uh, none other than Richard Fortus from Guns N' Roses. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. so he played guitar on the song. We had a ball doing it, even though we weren't together. You know, we recorded it about three and a half months ago. And I want to say that it was about two weeks ago that uh, myself and my engineer, Stephen, we actually mixed the song and edited the video all, you know, in a few hours a day over the mm -hmm. course of like five or six days. Sure. And it came out great. It was a lot of fun. And the four of us had a great time working together. So I think we're going to do some more in the near future. We've all said yes to it. So that could be part of Animal Tactics. You know, awesome. I have other musicians um, lined up also. Um, uh, you might know the uh, the Kanata brothers, Jordan and Jared Kanata. Yeah, I know the names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So they're also involved with me. They're, they're nice. great. They're fantastic music, rock musicians and everything else. Right. So 
um, yeah, I think it'll be a big collaboration between a whole bunch of people on, on this project. That's so, awesome. Would there that. be any thoughts and maybe like, I know, like look at Eddie Van Halen's son. He was putting out a couple of songs, like a song every like six, eight weeks. Um, I was talking to Brian Wheat from Tesla. He's talking about putting out a song like every month, right? The idea of an album for some people is a little bit more old school. Any thought of ever putting out like a song here? Or yeah, song that, that's, I mean, we, I've already done that because mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, I did Rock the Nation for the same charity, the David Z Foundation. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. With, um, with, um, um, with, uh, uh, What's his name? Paulie Z singing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Kanata brothers playing, you know, guitar and drums, uh, respectively, you know, and and it and it was great. So yeah, I would say that that's a good possibility. But I'm, I'm probably going to end up making an album out of it. Yep. You know, um, I'm looking at um, eight originals nice. and like four unique copies that I happen to love and the people okay. that I play with too. So um, could Evil be one of them? Without a doubt, would Rock the Nation be one? Without a doubt. Nice. But I, I think that we're gonna we're go, now we're just starting to work on things that we can be together. So, awesome. yeah, I'll be doing another song. Um, you know, D agreed to play to do sing a song. D Snyder. Okay. Oh wow. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've gotten Eddie Ojeda. He definitely wants to play guitar. I'm gonna twist JJ's arm <laughs> to play on it also as a guest. Okay. You know, nice. Uh, Mike Portnoy said he'd play on it. Awesome. You know, so I have an incredible amount of great musicians um, that would love to play and appear on the album, you know, and then we have what we've done on Still Hungry and the Christmas album. We have Mendoza's Choir, and that'll be a whole load of well-known people and our families and stuff in it. That's awesome. So where could people keep up with news on that if they want to follow what's going on with you there? Area22productions.com. We put everything on there. Of course, Mark the Animal Mendoza on Facebook. Everything is put on there. I believe we do Instagram and Twitter, right? Yeah. So it's it, whatever the normal stuff is you go to. It's just that yeah. I know a lot about a lot. I just mm -hmm. don't do social media per se. Okay. So, uh, you know, I really don't have time to look at it. But uh, my lovely partner here, Laura May, uh, mm -hmm. you know, takes care of all that. Her and her son, Stephen, they take care of all of that for me. I see some things, you know, I went sure. to something important to let me know, but you know, a lot of people, you know, like like D and stuff is on Twitter all the time. And yep. I just I just don't have the time right. I'm doing so many things a day. And, and the last thing I want to do is look at my phone or look at a computer, you know, when I go through the day. But I had to do it for this. You know, I was almost not going to do what I was going to do. I was going to do an interview with you in smoke signals. <laughs> well, we're close enough. I might have seen them. <laughs> well, you're right. You're not that. Far. No, that's right. Exactly. That's how I can do smoke signals to you. It just takes a long time to answer the question. That's right. But we'd work it out. Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, Mark, this was great. I thank you so much for taking time with me today. And um, hey, man, any any time you just contact us. You know, we got something big coming on. And we'll let you know. But yes. you know, whatever you need. Please, it's great. It's big. Thank you for having me on your show. A lot of great questions, a lot of good stuff going back and forth, you know, and uh, Thank you. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Go check Mark out online. And uh, hopefully, Mark, for the New York area people, you'll be playing some shows in the near future. We could check you out in some of the, the shows around here. I expect to see you there. 100%. I will be there. You know, I'll it's tell you, not... I'll share with you a funny story. I was at the Twisted Sister when the movie was premiered here on Long Island. Yeah. I was there with my daughter. And I ordered a popcorn. I didn't know that you and JJ were going to be there that night. I ordered a popcorn. I'm standing in the lobby. I'm waiting for my daughter to get her soda. And you, unknown to me, was you. But you just reach over, grab your hand in, and start eating some of the popcorn. You're like, thanks a lot. I turn around. I look. I'm like, oh, crap. It's Mark. <laughs> and I was like, that is just such a funny moment from that night that I remember. And I'm like, that's so damn great. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, kidding around, but yeah, she's oh, of course, no, I think Laura's back here shaking her head, going, "Yeah, that's Mark." <laughs> no, I thought it was hilarious, yeah. and, and it was totally caught me off guard. Have to make a big entry. Yeah, I thought it was hilarious, and it's one of my favorite memories from that night going to see the movie. Is <laughs> that all of a sudden somebody's dig digging their hand in, and it's Mark Mendoza? I'm like, oh, that's pretty exactly. damn cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's all Mark's dirty hand in your pocket. There you go. <laughs> Not all cool. Exactly. So I was at that, and definitely I'll be checking you out next time you're in playing one of these shows around here. Please, all do. Absolutely. Will do. Thanks a lot, Mark. Take it easy. Be well, be safe. Talk to you soon. Yes, you got it. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty. There you have it. I'd like to thank Mark for spending an hour with me talking all about Twisted Sister, some of the future plans for releases that the band have in mind, what it was like playing with D again last month, 
as well as Mark's thoughts on a possible Twisted Sister reunion in the future. Thanks so much, Mark. It was really great talking with you and also reminiscing about some of the good old days of Twisted Sister. I'd also like to thank Steve for helping connect me with Mark. Thanks so much, Steve. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. I'm at Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.